All right, so um, let's begin with questions. So office hours are getting absolutely swamped, and I got students from my other classes with projects coming up due, so they're coming in, and I got advising students coming in. So office hours are getting pretty crazy. So if, if you've got questions on PA5, this is a really good place to ask them, even if they feel kind of... of specific if there's any generality at all to them let's talk about them here because whatever you're struggling with probably other students are struggling with also so networking threading So, so I would definitely put the network stuff in a separate class and a separate thread. Um, so you have a part of your program which is receiving mouse click information from the other user. Um, and, and that's going to look something like... You know, you have a scanner created on your socket, so well, SC dot has next line. Call the next line method on that socket. Save that in a string temp, right? Parse that into a pair of XY coordinates and call your click code with XY or detect a quit message and do whatever you have to do to quit which in a thread is really just doing a return so somewhere in your program you're going to have this infinite loop and you can't do this anywhere in your swing code so, so if we didn't have to deal with the realities of swing and stuff, here's what you could do. In your, your mouse listener, person clicks a mouse, you go ahead, you figure out the XY coordinate row column, set the booleans, all that kind of stuff. If it's the other player's turn, then you could sit there in a loop and wait to receive a click from the other user. But if you do this, this loop inside your, your mouse listener or any other swing event, um, your window basically freezes. If you draw another window over it and then remove that window, you're going to get that effect of, of, you know, the partially drawn window and all that kind of stuff. So all of this should be in a separate thread. And the main thing that thread does is just sit there, wait for information from the socket, parse it out, and respond to it, typically by calling your click code to... Um, process the fact that the other player just clicked the mouse at a certain x, y. But then your main thread also needs to, your mouse listener, when, when you click somewhere in your game field and, and you know your code updates the board based on that, you need to send that x, y information to the other side. Um, and you just do that by, by basically printing something out to the print writer associated with the socket. Um, my suggestion has been, you know, put a method in this class, this MyThread class, put a method in there that will let you say, you know, send an XY pair to the other, the other person in this communication or send a quit message or in the beginning send my name and that kind of thing. So one class extending thread handles both client and server. Yeah, um, and and you might you know need to to make some differentiation. So um, depending on how you do this, so so one possibility is you know when you hit the connect button, go ahead and and create the server socket, or or when you hit the start button on the server side, create the server socket, call accept to get a connection. When you get a connection, you've got a socket now. Um, you could pass that socket to your thread constructor, and then and then your thread's basically doing the same whether you're the client or the server. Or you may want to to handle all of the the network stuff inside this thread class, 
in which case you've got you've got two different situations. So this is the most the most uh, diverse possibility. Um, so on the server, make a server socket. Accept. Make a print writer. Make a scanner. Um, send name. Get name. On the client side, so if you've got the radio button set to client and you hit the connect button, um, construct socket to connect to the server socket on the server side. Make a print writer, make a scanner, maybe get the name from the other person, send your name, and then you're going to do the same thing, right? So you're going to, to set a flag here saying it's your turn, you're going to set a flag here saying it's the other player's turn. But then, then the thread basically does the same thing. So, so, um, while it has the next line, get the next line. Parse that line and process it. And just kind of do that forever. So maybe you want to construct the flag construct the thread with a flag saying you're the server you're the client and then in the beginning you know if i'm the server do these things if i'm the client do those things and then just go into a standard thing or maybe you just want to do these in the constructor of the thread and then have this be what your run method does right there's different ways you can set it up uh let's see how would you close a server socket that has been opened but wasn't successfully closed later? Um, closed later. So, so one thing you can do on the server side after you accept a connection, you can close the server socket right here. Because when you accept the connection, that means the client has hit their connect button. They've created a socket. It's connected to you. You've got a socket, you know, that came back from the accept call. Now you've got a socket connected to the client socket. You don't need the server socket anymore. So you could close it right there, or you could close it at the end when you exit. Um, in practice, if you don't close it at all, when your program exits, it will get shut down, but it might take a minute, um, depending on your operating system. But since we're only requiring um, one, one instance of the game, right? You start the server, you start the client, you connect, you play, you exit or quit or finish, and then you're done. You don't have to have replays and so on and so forth. Um, and we're assuming that the client and server are well behaved. So the client's not gonna try to connect before the server is running and so on and so forth. So, so it simplifies some of, of the shutdown business. Uh, print writer, scanner, and socket can be the same class variables for both client and server. Is differentiate between client and server that accept? Yep, that's really the main difference is is making a server socket and accepting, or constructing a socket and naming the machine and the port of the server socket. And really, this is all the same: making the print writer and the scanner. And actually, if you both send the name and then try to get the name, you can do exactly the same thing there also. But you can't both try to receive the name first because you'll deadlock. But you can both print the name through your print writer and then read from the scanner and that'll work fine. So it's mostly mostly identical for both sides. Alright, what's the difference between start and run? When do we use the other? Oh no, that's good. Um, all right, so this is this is a really kind of weird thing about threads in Java, um, and it usually takes a number of tries for this to really click. So let's let's suppose we have something like my thread. And we construct this my thread, and this is this is some class we've created that extends a thread, 
okay? Um, at some point, we're going to say mt.start. Okay, it does not matter what the, the code inside the thread is set up to do. When we call mt.start, this finishes right away and comes back to us, and we continue doing this other stuff. But typically when we do this, um, the thread's going to start doing something and it's going to hang around for a long time. But we don't wait for the thread to finish, right? This is just a call to a method, but when we call this method, two things happen. Okay, so, so one, um, a new thread is created, and two, mt.run is executed by that new thread. So we're, nev we're pretty much never going to call run. Okay, we're only going to call start. But what that's going to do is create a new process, and then the run method is going to be executed in that process. So we're going to write a method called run, but we're going to ask to execute a method called start. All right, so the difference is run is the method that you write that has all the code you want executed, but start is what you call to say, hey, go ahead and, and call run, but do it as a new process. If I just called run from here, then then this thread is executing mt.run, just like any other method. But when, when I call mt.start, this thread is is not executing the run method, right? The JVM is creating a new thread, and that new thread is executing mt.run. And so that's that's just kind of quirky, but but Sample code helps sometimes with that. So start is is kind of a wrapper. Um, So let's make a new thread. Um, let's just call it T. And then ask T to run mt.run. That's really what mt.start does. Right? It says create a new thread and make that new thread execute the run method. So starts this one thing we call that does these two operations. So it's kind of a wrapper around this machine that makes a new process and then and then starts that process executing run. And yes, uh, run is public um, because start needs to get to it. So, um, so we played around with this in this morning's class, and um, and I think it's worth going through in here. So, so I've had students coming in and asking about how um, how to use the thread to send a mouse click if the thread is sitting inside this this while loop, right? Most of the time, your thread is sitting inside this call to has next line. And until a line comes in on the socket from the other side, um, you're going to be sitting kind of inside this call. And you only come back from this method when a line appears on the socket, something that ends with a new line. And then at that point, you can go ahead and you can ingest the line and break it out and so on and so forth. And then you go right back here and you start waiting again. And so, yeah, so, so the question is, I'm telling you to go ahead and put a method in your, your net thread that you can use to send information to the other side, to send a quit message or to send x, y coordinates. How does that work if we're sitting inside this this um, this has next line call? 
So so let me let me show you a sample piece of code, um, a pair of, of things. So this is not an exact replica of what you're doing in PA5, but it addresses kind of the same issue. So um, let's take a look at my thread. So it extends thread, and here's the run method. And the run method, you know, for PA5 is is this this while loop that sits there and waits for information to come in. But we've got something equally kind of annoying here, which is our run method is just going to print out the numbers from 0 to 19, one second apart. Okay, so it's just going just gonna to hang out, and it's going to, you know, print out 0, 1, 2, right? So it, when we start this thread, it's pretty clearly going to be in this for loop. All right, and it's going to be in there for 20 seconds. But nonetheless, what we're going to do is we're going to call this send method. And even though we're sitting in this for loop, this send method is going to print out a message. Now, again, for PA5, what we want to do is we want to, you know, actually send this over to um, the socket so that the other side receives it. But I don't want to put socket code in here. So so um, this this will will, you know, perhaps look like it can't work because if we're sitting in this for loop, how can we go ahead and do this? But this will work really easily. So let, let me demonstrate this and let's talk about why this works and why it seems like maybe it shouldn't. Um, so here's, here's my construction of a my thread. I'm going to call the start method. And then here I'm just going to sleep for five seconds. Then I'm going to call the send method. Right, and the send method is is going to go ahead and say, you know, print this out. So if I run this, right, the thread starts running. It's clearly inside the for loop, but after five seconds, our main program calls the send method, and that send method executes right away. And that that can feel, you know, kind of like. I don't know, magical or, or like it shouldn't be able to do that, but it does. So let's look at, at what's actually happening there. So it's only the run method that's actually running in a new thread. So, so let's forget about threads for a second right this is the name of a class my thread this is a constructor i'm saying new followed by a constructor that's creating an object of type my thread that object is called mt before we ever talked about threads what did we do we created objects and then we ran methods inside those objects how do we run a method by saying object name period method name how do we read a variable? Object name, period, name of variable. Right? This is, this is you know, 224 structures, right? Structure dot name of field. So if we don't think about threads, right, this is just, you know, running a method from this object. This is running a different method from this object. The only thing that's that's kind of weird here is that when I when I call this, something strange happens. A new process is created. And that new process is executing mt.run. But even though that new process is sitting inside this for loop, why should that stop this thread, this process, from going on and executing a sleep statement and some print statements and maybe executing, you know, a method inside that mt object? So this is not, this has nothing to do with this, right? This for loop is executing in an entirely different process over here. Here's a whole new process, a thread going, you know, sleep, print, sleep, print, sleep, print. This is my main thread, which said, you know, create a thread, call the start method, sleep five seconds, call the send method. It's completely got its own essence, right? So, so even though we started another process that's executing a loop inside a method of MT, right, I'm totally free to call this method of MT, and, and there's no reason it shouldn't execute right away.
So yeah, someone said in chat, um, the run method is running in a new thread. Now, if I wanted to to you know call the run method from here, I could say mt dot run. That's totally fine. There's no reason that two threads can't execute the same method, right? I could have you know 15 threads all executing the same um, you know two string method on a linked list and converting it to a string, or the area method on a rectangle, or or things like that. The whole idea of having threads is that you have multiple execution contexts. The only time you got to be a little careful with this is if we're modifying data. So if, if this method and this method were trying to write the same object inside this object MT, then you can get into those, those conflicts that we were playing with last week where you're doing read, modify, write, set, overwrite, and then you might have to worry about synchronizing. Or, or doing something to to maintain data, data integrity, make it thread safe. But we're not doing that. We're, we don't need to do that in PA5, right? We're, we're really just kind of doing one thing at a time, even though we have a thread. Um, the whole purpose of having the thread, though, is so that, you know, something can hang out here, receive the mouse click information from the other side without our main thread, which is running swing, having to sit there and wait for this to happen. So it happens in the background, but there's nothing to stop us from from having a method like, you know, send x y to other player. And our our mouse listener inside our my panel, when we click the mouse, can call you know net thread dot send x y to other player, pass the x y coordinates. And this will just use the print writer to print the uh, coordinates to the socket and send them off to the other side. So I don't know if that helps. I don't know if that makes more sense. Um, but think about it. All right, so question, will the quit button terminate the entire program for both players? Yeah, that's the intent. Um, and so, so how does that work? Well, let's say, you know, I'm sitting here, my net thread is in this loop, um, and the other player hits their quit button. So you have to set up some protocol. Normally, when you send an XY pair, maybe it's, you know, uh, coordinate XY. I think that's a protocol I suggested in, in the write-up. Um, so when I get this line, right, I can just check to see if the first character is a C, and if it is, I can parse out the X and the Y, and I can call the mouse click code. But maybe our protocol is if the first character is a Q, that's a quit message. So in here, first thing I do, if temp.car at zero equals, quote, Q, then I know the other player has quit. So what do I do? Well, um, maybe I'll set a flag somewhere. Um, and then I'll just do a return to end this thread, or maybe I'll just do system.exit to close everything out. Or maybe, you know, I'll, I'll display a message um, in a modal dialog box saying, other player has quit, you win, and you click OK, and then it does system.exit. It's up to you. And I'm not too concerned about the shutdown part of this. Now, if, if we're doing full duplex communication where we have two threads, Shutting down gets tricky because you have one thread that's that's doing one thing, another that's doing something else, and you have to communicate. But but um, it's usually pretty pretty straightforward to shut this down. Um, so don't don't get too bogged down in that. The other thing is you really only need one thread. The examples we were doing yesterday with with client server pairs and the threads, we had a pair of threads. Um, because we wanted full duplex communication, we wanted to be able to, you know, send and receive independent of each other. So that if we were in the middle of sending something, we could receive a bunch of messages from the other side. And we didn't have to, you know, wait until we sent something before we could receive another message. But that's not the case in, in PA5. In PA5, it's a really well-defined dialogue. 
right? So, so uh, server and client, um, send name, receive name. Step three, send name. Step four, receive name. Step five, send XY. Step six, receive XY. Step seven, send XY. Step eight, receive XY. And and these will just keep continuing, right? There's there's not going to be a case where I think I'm waiting to receive something and the other side thinks it's waiting to receive something from me. So because we agree that the server is going first and each side knows if they're the client or the server, right, you just have to start it off and make sure the server is, is um, you know, prepared to send, the client prepared to receive. And even this you don't really have to worry about, right, because, because you're just going to go into a loop that just sits there and basically says, hey, you know, wait for a message. And if, if I'm on the server side, I'm not going to get a message until I've sent something, the client has received it, and then the client player has clicked the mouse and that's been sent. But that doesn't matter, right? Just jump into a, a while loop in your thread, wait for, for coordinates. When you get coordinates, call your click code, go back, wait for more coordinates. If you get a quit message, just quit. All right, let's see. Um, got my multi-client thing fully working, by the way. Oh, cool. Okay. I'm uh, going to have to enlist some friends to help me test that. That should be fun. Yeah, definitely. You can share the class files freely um, anytime you like. Yeah, that would be cool, actually. Maybe, uh, maybe we can get a bunch of people playing on the server. All right, so we have the run, which sets up the socket and the infinite loop, which receives. What is the actual command to send data across the socket? So, okay, so these, these are all really good questions, by the way. Um, so your, your net thread is hanging out in that loop. So, you know, in the net thread class, you can make something like... Um, All right, send x, y, integer x, integer y. Um, assuming that your net thread, you know, knows about the print writer object, and let's say it's pw, this is, this is a couple of lines, pw.printline. And pw.flush. That's kind of all you need. So, so this is assuming that, you know, the message you want to send is a C followed by a space, followed by the X, a space, and then the Y. But, you know, it's up to you how you want to convey coordinate information from, from side to side. But if you wanted to do this or whatever, right, just, just use your print writer, use a print line, make sure you use the flush, right, this is super duper important. And if you don't flush, it looks like nothing is working. You end up breaking your code and ripping it apart and doing all this other stuff. Make sure you flush any time you print. Um, and that's really all you need. So in my mouse handler code, if my net thread was called nt, I'd just do, you know, nt dot send x, y, e dot get x, e dot get y. With the caveat, um, make sure that it's your turn first. Yeah, you need to flush. <laughs> so make sure it's your turn before you send mouse click information to the other side. Because the other side, as soon as it gets mouse click information, it's going to go ahead and, and call the click code. And if it's not your turn, but you send you know an XY pair anyway, um, unless the other side is checking for that, it's probably just going to go ahead and give you a move out of turn. So don't call that send code unless it's your turn. Check your flag first. 
if it's not your turn, bark at the user and then just, you know, get out of your listener. But if it is your turn, you know, use the event and the mouse listener, get the XY coordinates, pass those to the send method, and you're good to go. Let's see, my clients send click no matter what, but if it's not their turn, the server sends back the passive aggressive message. That's cool. And that's nice to do because then, you know, other people can see, like, who's trying to go out of turn. Um, and then you can start, you know, social engineering and then send data to Google and, and feed the beast. Um, no. <laughs> um, cool. Yeah. And don't forget to collect location info. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they should just say, you know, NetDot has already figured out your location. <laughs> Alrighty, what else? This is good stuff. Triangulating. All right, so we're doing open lab tomorrow. It's our last open lab of the year. Um, but, but people are still um, trying to figure out um, trying to nail down the last details of PA5. So we're going to do open lab tomorrow. Um, I also have office hours at 8.45, but like I say, those are getting a little crazy. But if you show up early, um, there's a good chance you'll get in. Um, but then open lab at um, 2 o'clock. And then PA5 due Friday morning. Um, I emailed the four people who, who committed to or, or are partially committed to um, doing their SLP in the morning session. So I sent you Zoom info through Canvas. Everybody else will do SLP presentations Monday during class time. All right, so let's just talk briefly about plans for the rest of the quarter, um, which at this point is, you know, a few days, really. Um, so um, today I want to um, finish up by talking about runnables, which is another way to do threads. Um, so we'll, we'll look at implementing a runnable, and that will take us to looking at this notion of implementing an interface, um, abstract classes, things like that, and we'll talk more about that on Friday. Tomorrow's open lab. Friday we'll we'll continue talking about implements, which is another keyword, um, and then I'll loop back and and um, talk about um, generics. And when we learned how to use generics for lists and hash maps and things like that, um, I mentioned it's pretty easy to write your own generic classes. So we'll we'll see how to do that, and it's it's just more syntax. Um, so we'll, we'll do that. That will probably be Friday, plus we'll talk about PA5. Um, and then we have one more week after that. So this is week 9. Um, and then we have next week also week 10. So next week I want to talk about the URL class, which is another way to, to do networking, but kind of more um, um, higher level. So we're, we're doing sockets to make TCP IP connections to um to clients and servers um but let's let's go to a higher level and and look at the url class so we can actually connect to say an http server and request web pages and things like that and we'll we'll cobble together a little uh web browser in java um so we'll do that that'll take a day or two um i want to glance through some source code for java because java is open source we can pull down the source code and what is java written in it's mostly written in java so we can look at the Java code for, say, a scanner or a linked list or a hash map, and that's kind of fun to look at. So we'll, we'll play around with that a little. Um, I want to go through a few other data structure things if we have time, like Huffman coding and um, red-black trees. Um, so, so some data structure work. Um, and I want to spend probably one class talking about Android development. 
So um, we'll we'll kind of go start to finish. We'll fire up Android Studio. We'll um, create a GUI that responds to buttons and make some text appear and things like that. Um, because it's very much like you know what we've been doing with Eclipse and Swing and Window Builder. It's it's drag and drop. But you know you can you can take what you know how to do on Eclipse and you can use it to make you know an Android app. Um, and you know Android devices are cheap. And, and you don't need a license or anything to develop apps for them. You can just push them out over a USB cable and, you know, build apps that take advantage of things like, you know, accelerometers and GPS and cameras and all kinds of stuff. So we'll have fun with that. Um, Monday we'll be doing SLP presentations. I hope to leave, you know, at least one day at the end next week to... Um, you know, wrap up, talk about topics for the final, logistics for the final, and so on. So, um, so that's pretty much what the plan is from here on out. Um, so it's good stuff. And then we're done. Um, so let me, um, let me talk about runnables. So we, we know how to make a thread by, by, um, you know, defining a class and saying extends thread. Um, the the only real downside to that is Java only lets you extend a single class. And we know, for example, if we want to do some painting on a panel, we make a my panel that extends a J panel. Well, if we wanted that to run in a thread, for example, we wouldn't be able to do it because we can't extend both a J panel and a thread. Um, and so, so sometimes you want to extend another class, but we still want to be able to, to execute a set of code as a separate, um, a separate process or a separate thread. So we can do something slightly different. So here's here's something that you know, if this extended thread, this would look like like an example we've done before. Um, so I've got a constructor. I'm calling this class my run for my runnable. I've got a constructor that takes an integer and just saves it in this this field up here, and then a run method which will print out the numbers from zero to ninety nine with the thread ID in the beginning, a space afterwards and then print a message at the end when it's exiting. So, so if I said class my run extends thread, this is, this is something we've seen before. So let's, um, So let's make three threads, MR1, 2, and 3. And we'll go ahead and start these. And then we'll go ahead and exit. So this is this is threads the way that we've we've normally done it. So we just have a class that extends a thread. And so this, you know, we've seen this before. Um, thread two starts running. Oh, that doesn't look very exciting. Yeah, okay. So thread two happened to to get a bunch of CPU time and exited before thread one started. Um, thread three, I don't know where thread three started. Okay, threads one and three started at the same time here. So thread two got like the whole CPU, went through its whole cycle, exited, and then threads one and three started, and you can see they're interleaving over here. And then thread three got a good run, exited, and then thread one finished up. And every time you do this, right, you get different behavior. So here, thread one exited first. Here, thread three exited first, and so on. All right, so if we want to do this without extending a thread, we can do the following. 
we can say implement runnable. And then we can do the following. So we, we declare a thread, and it's just a plain old thread, not a my thread, right? So we declare t to be a thread, and then we say um, construct it. So construct a new thread, but the argument to the constructor is an instance of our runnable, an instance of my run. All right, so what's going on here? I'm constructing a my run object. That's what this is. I'm passing a one to the constructor so that ID is equal to one. And I'm taking that object and using that to construct a thread. But this thread T is now constructed so that when I call the start method, it calls the run method inside this my run class, which is, which is the, the, um, which is this loop. So then I call T start. So then I do that two more times, make a thread. It's still called T, but it's a new thread constructed with a runnable with an ID of two. And I start that, and then I make a third thread constructed with a runnable of my run with an ID of three, and I start that. And the, the significant difference here is that instead of extending a thread, I'm implementing a runnable. So if I wanted my run to extend something else, I could say extends, you know, whatever, link list or whatever I want to build on, rectangle. So if I do that, this runs and it, it does the same thing. The three threads interleave. You can see that main exited, you know, early in thread one's execution. Um, and thread one started off first but didn't finish until close to the end. Thread two got a good run and so on. So this is, this is, you know, executing in parallel. That's why run has to be public instead of protected, I believe, because of runnable. Without that, I think run could be protected instead of public. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. Oh, that's not what I meant. Uh, let's just see what that does. That seems to work protected. Oh, what did I change? Oh. So when you're implementing, you have to you have to uh, follow the protection of the template. All right. So we'll we'll um. We'll we'll play around with um interfaces on Friday um, and an interface is basically right we can we can define our own interface that something can implement and the idea is for example when we say um, implements runnable what is runnable well it's an interface right and it has one method which is called run and if we say that this class is going to implement runnable, then we're required to have a method named run, which returns a void. And if we don't, for example, if I call this our run, and then I try to compile, I'll get an error message saying my run does not override the required method run. So this implements keyword is a way that we can say, okay, I'm going to give you a description of what kinds of methods you need to implement in order to implement this, this interface. And, and this, is, this is really dealing with this idea of abstract data types. So when we talked about abstract data types in 222, 
the idea was, you know, when we talked about an abstract uh, stack, for example, we said, well, we want to be able to initialize, push, pop, and see if the stack's empty, right? And, and the expectation was a user who was using our stack package would write code that calls those functions or methods now, um, and they didn't have to worry about how those functions did what they did. They just knew I want to call push and I want to pass an integer. I want to call pop and it's going to return an integer. I want to call is empty and I'll get back a boolean. And I want to call a knit and it's going to empty out my stack. And so, so by creating an interface, we can, we can say, okay, if you want to write your own version of a stack, you can do that. But you need to have these four methods, initialize, push, pop, and is empty. And they need to have these signatures, these arguments, these types of return values. But our interface doesn't specify what that code has to do. It's specifying how an outside entity would interact with this class, right? So it's, it's forcing the signature of these methods and a few other things. And so it, it lets us, um, you know, open up uh, to developers a way to create their own version of, say, a stack implementation but still maintain this fixed interface and so when when we have say a mouse listener or an event listener or something like that in swing if you look at the code that's created by window builder it says um you know such and such implements event listener and that means it's using this interface and swing is not putting a requirement on us as far as what that event listener does but we've got to have certain methods with certain signatures in order for for this to interact with swing so it sort of puts a a blueprint out there that we have to match so we'll we'll code that up on friday um we'll play with generics and then um and then we'll move on from there all right cool um open lab tomorrow i'll see you there if you want to come in and work on code or i'll see you in office hours otherwise i will see you friday all right thanks everyone have a good one